Good evening, guys. Just firing up my other side of the live chat over here. Good to see you. So this is the great thing about paragliding. There's always somebody paragliding somewhere in the world. So right now it's about 3 a.m. in the UK, but this makes it about uh, 7 p.m. in California. And uh, I don't know what time it is in Brazil, but also sometime in the evening. So I've got guys around the world um, that are signing into the live chat. And uh, it's great to get in touch with everybody. And uh, got the live chat going here. So that's how I keep in, in touch with your questions. So if you've got questions, please pop them on the live chat. Um, I will get to them as we go through the evening. And um, uh, if, you, if I haven't answered your question, then please just ask it again, because things do scroll past me. And I've got to try and keep track of questions. I um, don't have my whole team of assistants here and, um, you know, my live uh, overlay on the screen. <laughs> I like to keep things simple so that it's mobile, um, which means that when the summer comes, I can actually do this live streaming out and about and on the sites. So thanks for, thanks for joining. Hi, Gary. Um, Gary asks, I used to fly a Sigma 2 20 years ago. At the time, I had 150 hours thermic flight, then I stopped. Have paragliders become more stable in the B class? Well, Gary, good news for you. There's been a lot of progression. Um, the first thing to say is uh, the Sigma is no longer a B, it's a C. Um, they used to have gliders divided. Um, what did we have? We had um, DHV2. I think it was. Um, a B isn't the equivalent. A B is like a DHV12. And the Sigma is a C. And what's happened in the B class, I and mean, if you're getting back into paragliding now, I'd suggest not coming in at the Sigma level, coming in at the one class below that. Um, if you're looking at a mid B, you're looking at something like the Epsilon. And that is a sweet glider. Um, that's a really nice handling glider. It's got uh, good responses. But what's changed a lot, I think, between now and 20 years ago, is the way the gliders absorb shooting forward. There's a big difference now where you go through turbulence, let's say you go outside a thermal and you hit the sink. The glider now doesn't dive as hard as they used to. They used to go whoop ahead. And then as soon as they, they went ahead of vertical in the olden days, the gliders used to fold. They really didn't have much resistance at pitching forward. The nose used to go and used to get collapses. Particularly when you accelerate the wing. That has improved a lot. If you're just flying around and you're just cruising around in a the thermal, you won't notice a huge difference. It's not like a, a game-changing, like, wow, this thing is a completely different aircraft. They are still paragliders, but that going forward accelerated and the way that it holds itself together in the air has improved a lot. And the, the shaping of the whole leading edge is now so much more slick and clean and tight. The, the glider holds itself like with some tension pulling out towards the wingtips, whereas before it was a little bit more yeah, floppy and baggy. So I think you're going to find that uh, things have improved a lot and it's a good time to get back into the sport now. It's, it really has matured. The glider designs are super, super good and you'll get way more performance in the B class now than you used to on your Sigma in what is now the C class. No need to go up to the C class when you're getting back in. Um, Guys, if any of you could let me know that you're getting the audio through, I don't have any feedback loop where I can tell, um, so let me know. Um, being three o'clock in the morning, I'm a little bit slow. I can just turn the volume up here and see that I've got volume. Yay, okay, that's working. <laughs> Brain's not yet, <laughs> but we'll get there. Fire some questions at me and I will respond and catch up with what you want to know. Um, 
Yeah, I'm just talking about glider development at the moment and how things have changed over the years. Um, a, a big change is going up to the D class, the two liners um, from way back when. Uh, oh, we used to fly wings that were that frankly would terrify me now. <laughs> they they would not be stable at um, when they were accelerated. I mean, if you flew along and you you had the brakes you know ready all the time, you could catch every little collapse that wanted to happen. But man, if you accelerated that wing, that thing was going to blow out at some point, and things could get interesting. And the gliders seemed to, when, when they collapsed, they turned into a flapping bag of washing. They didn't have the, the way the gliders come back now. Now, if you're flying a two-liner, it's incredibly resilient. It really holds itself together and it doesn't go. And then when it does go, I mean, they, they go in and out really quickly. Um, assuming that you know what you're doing with your piloting, the same pilots that could fly the high performance gliders 20 years ago have no problem getting onto a two liner and you you find you just you're not having collapses in the first place because they are the gliders are just so tensioned up and then when they do go they're like bang bang like an aggressive in and out which i find helpful um i don't mind that it's aggressive it comes back i've got something to work with um so that's a big change and the the speed change on the two liner d accelerated that's significant um, we're now getting wings that are mm, i suppose 60 kilometers an hour um, top speed whereas the olden days wings mm, i don't think they were more than about 46 47 <laughs> um, which is a huge change if you're flying in mountains to have that extra 10 k's an hour, it, it just means that you can explore and you, you're more relaxed because you've got this freedom to move through the air. You're not held back because you're like always at your trim speed basically and you're just pinned in the mountains. So that's a big change that's happened. Um, um, and that's, it's been gradual. Um, you know, nothing much has changed in the last couple of years. But if you look back 20 years, then you see that over time things have improved a lot. Um, and also the performance, of course, has increased, the particularly accelerated performance. And I think what's happened is we've gone over a kind of a hurdle for cross-country flying, where we used to have a particular dismal glide angle, particularly into wind. Um, and we've just increased that enough that we're now linking a whole lot more of the cross-country days. So where before your glide was just not enough to reach the next thermal, um, if you take it statistically over the day and you look at your, your chances of intersecting another thermal just on a straight line, that has remarkably improved. Just by that little change in glide angle, you've now got a lot more thermal cores that you're likely to intersect on a, you know average basis. So that means that all of a sudden, the cross countries have gone from being like 100 k's was a big deal back in 20 years ago. I mean, that was a that was the grail, holy grail we were aiming for, 100 k's. Now, I mean, the guys are flying 500s. Um, that is just astounding. So we're getting very close to and often beating the hang glider records in sights. Um, okay, we're not at the hang glider level yet, guys, and. <laughs> If there are any hang gliders flying and <laughs> listening on the, on the live stream, oops, sorry, um, you've still got more performance than us. Um, I'd love to have a, the hang glider performance into wind. Um, but generally, cross-country flying, you will see that the, the paragliders and hang gliders now, yeah, hang gliders got to work to, to get ahead. Um, and that's maybe something to chat about as well is, is the, the difference between hang gliding and paragliding. It's surprising um, that hang gliders haven't you know, gone three times better than paragliders, given that they've got that into wind glide performance. But I think what limits hang gliders is the landing fear or the concern or the need to have a proper landing. 
Um, and with a paraglider, when you've got your, your technique down for landing in tight spots, you can land just about anywhere. That frees your mind up when you're doing cross-country flying. Yeah, you can just go and follow the best lift line. You don't have to think all the time, oh, gee, there's nothing here. Ooh. For sure, you need some sort of landing, but most terrain is landable. Um, okay, there's some exception in the States with some big forests and some areas with bears. <laughs> it depends how far you want to push, but pretty much any surface, anything that's open, you can land on, on a paraglider. So that's allowed paraglider pilots to have a different mindset with cross-country flying to be able to just push and go and particularly if you've got lighter gear you don't worry about the walkout so much so you can just follow the sky um, and that attitude change I think helps a lot more attempts at cross-country um, it doesn't really help your performance at all but it's it's meaning that you're trying things you're going on different lines because well let's see what happens there Whereas hang gliders will tend to hold back and be more cautious and I would say in some cases be better pilots um, in the way of thinking. Um, you know, having options, making sure that you've got your glide to a landing. It's a safe way of flying. Paragliders can push a bit harder without really exposing themselves to much more risk because you can pretty much just slow down and stop and land on just about anything so that's I suppose helped um, increase the number of cross-country attempts that we make with paragliders and that means that we've got more effective performance which is very nice very nice to have all right um, guys I can see I've got uh, quite a few people in the chat if somebody would just drop me a chat comment I'm not getting updates so I just want to see, um, I'm going to try and put a comment here and see what happens and uh, see if it comes up in the chat. I'm getting a chat comment, but I need some of you guys to drop some questions in here just to see that it's actually live. <laughs> I'm uh, not too sure. Let's go here, live chat. Ah, oh, there we go technology all right so i was just trying to get a setting on my phone um thanks guys for some reason uh, youtube was filtering out everything <laughs> so i'm gonna go back um and pick up everybody sorry if i haven't said hi as you come in um hey edward nice to see you um i haven't stayed up too late to see you guys i've already been to bed so i'm ahead of everybody uh, it's monday morning here and I'm at work, <laughs> three o'clock. I'm gonna stay up from now. But what it means is I can go straight from this session into editing another video. So I've got a, a video, the next one coming up, I've just done a, a quick roundup of um, books to read while it's locked down in winter. So I've picked out my favorite books and um, I've done a little video on that. Um, and then I'm gonna be working through the rest of my planned videos. Um, what I'm doing at the moment with winter coming up, I'm working on developing my whole course structure for Fly With Greg for the website. So the way that works, some of you guys might know I've got a website with more in-depth detailed instructional content. So I do like longer deep dives into certain topics like half an hour and things like that. Um, and, but that takes quite a bit of planning. Um, so that's I'm using this time to kind of plan a nice structure so that there's a progression through the course um, so that you're covering pretty much all the key skills that I feel really help you progress as a pilot. So that's what I'm doing through the winter. I'll be doing quite a lot of videos there and it would be great for some of you guys to join. Um, that's how this whole Fly With Greg YouTube channel is funded. So it'd be fantastic if you want to drop in for one month or two months. Um, there is a free video starting on uh, Killing Your Wing. So you can pop in there on the website and go and have a check out and see what the content's like. So you can see if it's a match for you and if you like it. Cool. Uh, Joe Falcon. Hey. Hi, Utah. 
I'd love to come and fly in Utah. Um, you guys have got some amazing sights and I'm very jealous. Um, at this time of year, I particularly start feeling like, I really should be somewhere else because um, it gets kind of soggy in England and um, a bit boring. So enjoy your flying wherever you are. And if you're in Utah, you still got some flying in winter. Enjoy it. Post some videos for us so we can all see it. Um, and I'm, I'm really loving the way YouTube has just exploded with paragliding content this year. Um, a lot of new paragliding channels, a lot of you guys posting your own flying. Um, it's just become so accessible and it just means that my reality is just full of flying. It's brilliant. If it's not flyable here, you guys are flying. If you aren't flying, my friends in South Africa are flying. There's always something to go look at and you just get that fresh, like, reinforcement from cloud base which is really good <laughs> so that's partly what i'm trying to do as well is just uh, replace the reality on youtube with visuals for you of uh, flying and just talking about flying and uh, it keeps that part of your uh, enthusiasm and attention alive on paragliding you know we all go through ups and downs with the sport so i'm hoping that this kind of supercharges your flying and keeps your attention focused on the good stuff. Um, hey Nicola, from Italy, nice to see you. Uh, that must be pretty early in Italy, <laughs> before work. Um, hey Sasha, nice to see you. Sasha's a fellow pilot here in the UK. Um, I think he's uh, papillion paragliding and does tandems and stuff locally. So good to see you. Um, Sasha, that's really early, so maybe, um, maybe you're far on the east of Europe at the moment and uh, you're getting um, a bit uh, of sort of early morning action. <laughs> Robert Michaels, how you doing? Yes, it is early here, but I figured since uh, America can't come to me, I'll come to America. So, um, yeah, it's no problem for me. Just get up early and have a cup of coffee. Um, and it does mean that... Some of you guys that uh, find my live streams inconvenient can now join in. Um, so, hi. Um, okay. Edward, hi. Edward asks, thoughts on lightweight versus normal gliders. Trying to choose between the Delta 4 and Alpina 4. Right. I like lightweight gliders. Um, I'm a bit of a lightweight geek, okay? I, I love um, super light, ultra light, uh, everything as light as possible. I take off little elements in my harness and gear to make things like a few grams lighter. Um, this is partly because I'm actually incredibly lazy. Nobody knows this. <laughs> but I will always try and find the optimized way of doing things so that I reduce how much energy I have to expend. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I do, I love, also I love exercising and going out in the mountains and enjoying things, but man, I do get tired and I, I make sure that I'm not carrying anything that I don't need to carry. So I'm probably not your typical pilot in terms of what's the right way to go with gear, but I've used lightweight gear for quite a while now and I've been very impressed by how durable it is. Um, you know, it's maybe things have changed from the early days of ultralight gear, but the, the manufacturers have worked out how to work with the stuff. Um, I particularly like advanced lightweight stuff. I think their whole design philosophy, the way they test things and the way they are like uber safety conscious and like make sure they do 21 prototypes until they get it right. Um, that really gives me confidence when I go lightweight. Um, so... You want to make sure when you're going ultralight that you've had a look at an example of that glider that you're trying to get and just have a peep, particularly if you can find somebody that's got a used version or just ask on the forums of the one that you're looking at um, because not all manufacturers are as good with ultralight and it depends on the fabric they're using and how ultralight they've gone. There, there are two sort of ultralight strains. There's the one that they're trying to make for hike and fly races. Um, and there you, you're going absolutely minimal. 
it's probably lighter than most pilots want to go and need to go. Um, you you want to go something that's sort of semi-light, which means that they can at least put in some of the extra reinforcing to give you a little bit of beef in the glider. Um, an example is like uh, with Ozone, they have the Zeo Light, which is super light. I mean, it's three kilos or something crazy. That's probably lighter than most pilots want. Um, if you go to the Zeolite GT, I think it's another kilogram maybe, or I can't remember the details, but it's under a kilogram. It's close to four kilos on the glider. And that gives you the just the extra little bit of reinforcing. It gives the designers a little bit of free play to say, okay, let's beef this up a little bit and make it durable. That's what you're looking for. Um, I think the Alpina is closer to four kilos than three kilos from my memory. So I think you're looking there at that sort of semi-light um, it's not like ridiculously light. Um, but if you're getting a lightweight glider, just to save a little bit of weight on a, a walk up to the one launch site, and you typically fly across country to somewhere where you can get back easily, I still think a, a normal weight glider is a way to go for most pilots. Just because of the extra durability. Um, I think the ultralight gliders, you do start seeing it when they push over, let's say, 300 hours. Um, maybe some of them even at 200 hours. The glider starts to lose a little bit of that um, cohesiveness of the whole structure. Because all the elements are lightweight, and you're loading this thing, it just starts to get a little bit baggy, and the performance drops off, noticeably. So, you know, you're getting a good glider for 200 hours, I can say. For, for an ultralight glider, no problem. 200 hours, you've got a good wing. But then it starts dropping off that performance curve, and then you're not really getting the benefit of being on the C-class glider. You're kind of flying a B in terms of performance with the safety of now almost a D. When a glider starts aging and stretching and warping, you must remember now it's gone out of its EN shape it's EN tested recovery. If it was kind of in the middle or to the top of the class, you're pushing it over into the next class, which means if you have a collapse, it's not going to respond as cleanly and, and quickly as the designed original aerofoil. So that's why I'm looking at trying to get a semi-light or normal weight paraglider for general cross-country flying, particularly if you're flying in harsh environments. You want to have something that's got a little bit of tolerance for when it gets older. So you don't have to replace this thing. And it also means that when you try and resell the glider, if you try and resell an ultralight wing at 300 hours, it's, you're going to battle. There's, there are going to be few pilots that are going to be interested because there's that big question mark. Huh, is this thing actually going to hold itself together? So you've, it's quite an expensive game to play on the ultralight wings. You pay the same in the beginning, but your life, your effective life, and from a retail perspective, I would say you half your life of, you know, that life of the glider and how much money it costs you. So it, per hour, it's costing you almost double to get that ultralight wing. So think about that. Um, do you really, really need it? Um, it depends on what kind of flying you're doing. The positives, it is so much, so much nicer to carry. Um, you, you find that the biggest change is the volume in the wing. So when you pack that wing down, instead of having this bulging bag that's pulling your back over like this, it comes right up against your back. So you generally find you can, you can change your backpack when you get an ultralight wing, get a lighter, smaller bag, because everything's going to squash down. And that makes your carrying comfort so much better. So if you're going to be doing hiking with your gear, so if you want the freedom to do big walkouts for your cross country, or you're going to be doing adventure flying where you're going to go on a volberve, you're going to do sustained paragliding journeys, or you want to do the Alps, um, and you want to be able to just get on the train, get on the plane, everything be compact, fantastic. Um, but if you've got the money, get a second wing um, and have that ultralight wing for those special trips and really look after it. Um, it is still something that you need to be careful of and look after nicely. 
Um, to go back to Delta 4, Alpino 4, the change that you will feel, I think, in the, the Alpino 4 is that it's lighter. The lighter wing tends to have less inertia when you have movements in the air. So it moves around, rustles around a little bit more. I think it's a little bit lighter and a little bit quicker that you feel the movements of the wing. But then in the big movements, it tends to stop without so much energy, so much dive ahead. It's a little bit quicker on that. And the reinflation, I think, is a little bit quicker. So I think you kind of end up in the same place in a, in a safety, in respect to safety, that you've got slightly more movement. So it's slightly more alive feeling, a little bit more chatty, but a little bit quicker to come out of things as well. So overall, you're in about the same place. And uh, flying, you won't really notice much of a difference. Um, I, I found with a, with a lightweight wing, it's still a paraglider. It flies very much the same. And all you notice is when you on launch, you have to be a little bit more careful. And uh, some of the fabric, especially on the undersurface of these wings, super light you've got to be very very careful of it and it just makes it a little bit of extra concern that you're thinking about especially as your glider is aging that can start to wear on you on your thoughts a little bit like you're thinking mm, i've got that ultralight thing you know is it it just had this massive blood and bang out is it going to hold together it's a small factor but i think you know that stays with you so be sure you want it that's what I'm saying. Just be absolutely sure that there's a need for the light. Um, and then because you, you've met that need, you've got something that's now giving you a lot of pleasure. So bear that in mind when you're upgrading. Hope that helps your, your question, Edward. Um, okay, uh, GCM, you're saying video is a bit choppy. I'm doing the best I can. I've got my Wi-Fi right over there. So um, I've got a new phone, so this is the best that YouTube can do. I don't think it's anything to do with um, the environment here. Um, hi, Nick Platts. Hi, Ian Nicole. Nice to see you. And Peter Elliott, good to see you. Um, Peter Elliott's just uh, picking up again on, on that question about started, starting to fly again and Going, going back onto a C wing, and he says the big difference I notice is the retained energy, mainly trying to land it. Okay, way different than getting it down on short landing strips. Good point. That has changed. The, the way the wings um, retain energy and the kind of glide that you notice coming into landing, particularly if you're landing like slight downwind, the slight slope, man, the wings just keep going now. Um, whereas, yeah, in the olden days, the gliders, um, if they hit any turbulence or if you messed them around a little bit on the brakes, you just went down and then it kind of restarted. And it's a bit like you find on the single surface wings now. You have this thing where if you hit turbulence, hmm, they don't retain the energy because there isn't any um, inertia inside the wing in a single surface. And so the wing kind of like glides and glides and glides does these sort of steps and the old wings used to do that as well where you just come on they were so inefficient if they had any kind of turbulence but it went down a bit um, and that was helpful in landing that you could just kind of like hold the brakes a bit and you just go blur down and now you can't make the wings go blur anymore <laughs> so you need to learn the right technique for this um, i will be doing a detailed lesson on the butterfly flare um, this is the sort of stuff that I do on flywithgreg.com where I can take time and I can set up a whole lesson properly. Um, I don't do this on YouTube. I've got to have something for my members on Fly With Greg. Um, I might do a short compilation or a kind of a condensed version of it. Um, but this is one of the landing setup tricks that you can use um, to help you shorten your finals. Um, it's only something that I would do when I haven't got my setup right. It's not like something to rely on to do your setup every time. But you can bring the glider down close to stall 
release it so you're keeping that airflow going and you, you're making sure there's no stall attaching to the wing and then bring it down and slow it down, release it, bring it down and slow it down and it's a slow cadence like this. You're trying to slow it down and release, slow it down and release and that means that your forward speed through the air is just about at stall point so it's pretty slow and your performance with every time you release the glider and then hold it again you're getting these steps down. So you can step down like that with a butterfly flare to get you just to a point if you were overshooting. So that's maybe something to work on. Um, and I would suggest if you're gonna try and learn this technique is to find a slope like this, very gentle, that you can just get off the ground and then you can practice so you're touching down again and you, if you stall the wing, you're only like a meter off the ground. And that can give you that practice timing to learn where your stall point is, which is an exercise I think every pilot needs to do and regularly is practice where your stall point is when you're flying, not standing on the ground, but just above the ground. So this is a sort of low flying exercises that it might be tricky where you are um, if you've got a big rocky slope and a big drop off. <laughs> do a bit of driving, go for a weekend somewhere. You know, there, might, there must be a site somewhere that's used as a training site. Maybe you can ask one of the training schools if you can just come and mess around on their training slope for a day. You know, they might charge you something for getting onto the site. They might just be happy to see you. Um, but that's somewhere to go and practice if, you, if you're struggling on your sites. Just look around a little bit. There must be somewhere where your local paragliding school instructs. And if you approach them right, they might be happy. Um, maybe if you buy a harness from them, um, they might be happy to help you just play around low, low level flying. And that can help. Um, Nicola, hi. What time, what time of season do you recommend for changing gliders? Change at the end of the season? What do you think? Um, look, it, it totally depends on what you can do uh, with your travels. Um, yes, it's always good to ease into a new glider. Um, but equally, if you've got enough experience to go up, let's say you're upgrading, um, or even if you're just buying a new glider in that class, if you've, if you've kind of outgrown that glider, like you're completely comfortable with it, you've maybe done an SIV course in it, you've done lots of thermic flying, you could switch over at any time. You just, there's not a big change between every glider. You know, once you know how to fly a paraglider, you can pretty much fly any of them. They don't change suddenly, they just become a little bit more sensitive. So if you are cautious with your inputs and you spend some time, particularly ground handling and low flying, you, you, can, you can exchange a glider at any time it doesn't really matter. Of course, the ideal time would be, as you say, end of the season, you now get another glider, you into mellow conditions, you fly soaring through the winter, and then you're easing into the new year. Mm. Equally, I think a lot of pilots end up at the end of winter um, having not flown much. So it depends on how much time you've got available or whether you're going to go and do any trips overseas because you might end up at the end of the winter actually being barely current um, and not having adapted much to the glider in rate and then you're into spring conditions so <laughs> it hasn't really helped you much um, so yeah it, it depends on on your personal progression how much ahead of your own glider you're, you're at at the time to change um, I wouldn't recommend changing wings you know regularly um, until you've got a lot of experience, um, much better to do at least, I would say, 100 hours on a wing before you move on, um, so that you've had time to adapt and adjust and got used to that wing and kind of done all you can with it before moving on, unless you get something you really don't like and you want to move it on with like five hours of airtime on it so it's nice and crispy and you get a good resale value, um, that's a, an, another problem. Um, okay, Wesley, hi. Wesley says, when recovering from a full frontal, is it possible to stall the wing during the recovery? Mm -mm. My dad had a frontal where recovery is very slow, and we aren't sure what happened. All right. Yes, it is possible, and this is something that different wings behave differently, and it's not really, this isn't tested in the EN test. They do a frontal, 
and usually just hands up and the wing should open. Now frontal is usually the easiest maneuver to, to reopen from. The way the paraglide is designed, you lose the lift immediately because your leading edge goes in and under. You drop. As you drop, you will pull the lines. The ones that have got tension on them will be the back lines. The front ones are slack. So it's basically pulling the whole back of the glider down. That'll immediately reinflate the wing. And then because you're going down, the leading edge is exposed to the airflow and that will give you a suction and the wing will pull forward and off you go. So it's kind of like the perfect collapse for a paraglider. It's the one that it's, you couldn't design it better. It's got leading edge openings at the bottom of the wing. You drop, it opens. That wing should be banging out from a frontal. But we know things happen slightly differently in reality than the EN test. Um, your wing can go slightly asymmetrically on the frontal. The wing tips can come together. The wing might sort of stick in a little bit. And particularly if the glider has had a bit of age on it and you haven't had a trim checked, the glider could take longer to reinflate and open and refly. So the first thing I'd say, Wesley, is to make sure, take that glider and get a trim check. If you've got a service center you can send it into, fantastic. If not, go onto the website of the manufacturer, download the line plan for that glider, take a measuring tape and stretch, pull the lines with a little bit of tension on them and check and start off, just calibrate by taking one line and looking at a measurement so you can get some sort of calibration on your measuring system and the line plan and then just go out on all the lines and see if there's something like the lines are going out towards the tips or ABC usually that's where the problem is your C's are short your A's are long um, from flying and having tension on the A's and no tension on the C's depends on the, the material that you, your lines are made of but that can have a big effect so make sure that that glider is absolutely at trim, proper trim, and that the, the wing fabric isn't porous. Um, if it's starting to get old, when you have a frontal, there's a chance that some of the air is actually going through the glider because it's now porous, it's not nice and sealed. And the airfoil will break away in sections. That can delay your reinflation from a frontal. So have a look at that. That's the first thing I'd say is with the wing condition. Um, the second thing, some frontals and some gliders do have a tendency to struggle to open and depends on how, how the wing is reacted. Normally what I'd recommend with a frontal is to give a hard jab on the brakes to at least get the trailing edge underneath whatever's folded. So, but just in the process of doing that, and depending on the timing, if your wing goes forward, has a frontal, and you pull the brakes as you're kind of swinging through, on some of the wings, it will bang the wing open beautifully, and that'll help. On the others, it'll just give that little bit of disturbance that will stall the wing again. As you're dropping through, you've got a very high angle of attack, and pulling a little bit of brake, that can just stall it, and then you've got a stall, and because it was just a pump, the glider's gone back, then it dies forward, and has another frontal. You can see the problem. This can be a cycle, you can cascade this, because every time it dies forward, it has a frontal, you drop through, you pull the brakes, <laughs> and you just... <laughs> so, in that sort of situation, with that sort of response, I would do the pump the one time, and then I get this reaction, and then you need to put your hands up, it's hard to do, and just let yourself drop through and let the wing kind of sort itself out until you feel it's got some speed over it. So it might come out and go into a bit of a spiral, and then you can play with that. Now you've got some speed to work with, but sometimes you can't keep the glider so slow with such a vertical descent. Um, so it depends a lot, Wesley, on the input that your dad did. Um, there, it's very difficult without having a video. If you've got a video, send me a video and I can analyze it. Um, but hopefully that helps a little bit about your full frontal problem and uh, gives you some ideas about how to solve that. Um, 
Cool. Hi, Jeff. Nice to see you. Jeff Sinison. Um, just watch the spin video. Please explain more about the turns requirements. Um, okay. So this is the one I've just done with um, incident footage. So pilot sent me some stuff. Um, talking about the turns requirement. Um, so I think what Jeff's asking about is um, the thermaling and the guy at the end where um, he's flying quite slowly. Um, in the video there, his hands are down here somewhere. Um, and so he's flying along slowly, 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 slowly. And that's the best way to go into a kind of a helicopter spin um, on a wing by accident is if you're flying it really slowly and then you're just kind of holding a little bit more on the inside brake and you're in a thermal so the air airflow is coming from underneath you've got a high angle of attack and as you go into a little surge of lift the inside wing will tend to spin and the pilot there ends up kind of holding brakes for security because something's gone wrong and that's something that you need to retrain your brain that security which is kind of why I had it in the secrets of control as well as like holding on the brakes balancing your harness that transfers into holding on the brakes in a spin because you're trying to look for security so you really got to retrain your brain and hold the brakes like this just for a bit so you learn this secret of the glider is this delicate thing above you that you control and you're connected to with your brake hands and your harness is the thing that you want to use for your bulk of your like turning input and then the brake is just finessing that so to avoid that spin can be a little bit tricky when you're flying in strong thermic conditions and you get a big surge of lift on the, on the inside wing and speed is your friend there so if you're feeling airflow coming towards you in your face that's what you want in the thermal you don't want things to be going quiet and I presume that that pilot just before the glider spun there he would have thought oh everything's really gentle everything's gone quiet there's your signal hands up and then weight shift and then put the brake in again you should have a nice whistling sound as you're going around in your thermaling um, and that'll keep you away from that stall point um, and the other thing is just to keep it a visual look at that inside wingtip so right at the end of that video um, I, I explained it all in in one little video clip um, you can see me messing around my wing there and doing approach to stall point and then actually sp spinning the corner of the wing that's what you're looking for if you see that tip sort of bending back hands up back under the brake again you can just do that you just hand up and pull back and you get a nice turn um, So, carrying on, Prajwal, hi, why is there no provision yet in order to ensure total safety of the pilot, despite a crash? Um, okay, I'm not too sure how to interpret that question. Um, a system for the total safety of the pilot. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you mean some kind of uh, mechanism some kind of device that uh, ensures your the, the pilot safety um, I'm not sure if we're talking about an inflatable safety system which I think that they tried a few times um, I think over the years we've we've developed the safety gear as best we can um, and it's driven by what pilots are prepared to fly with um, you could probably have a better safety system with a you know gas inflated uh, zorb <laughs> that just inflates it around you. But who's going to fly with this thing? Um, so yeah, we've got foam in the harnesses, we've got helmets. That's the best we can do. The rest of us needs to move. Um, got some footwear on, and you've got a paraglider, your reserve parachute. Then you take your chances. Um, it's part of the part of the challenge of the sport and a bit of the thrill is that you, you've got to pay attention and get things right um, and I think the the most important way of improving your safety in the sport is watching videos learning gaining knowledge and then 
practicing things. Um, pilots often don't practice what they see. They see something, they learn it, and then they forget it. And you need to practice things, put them into your flying in the easy conditions where nothing's happening and you're soaring up and down and you're just getting a bit bored. That's when you should be practicing top landing approaches, slope landing approaches, low flying, stall point. You don't have to do SIV if you're soaring, but there's lots that you can do. Uh, practice on your 360 turns, see how tight you can get them, and just building up a sort of discipline of drilling yourself when you're flying. When it's easy, when it's light, drill yourself so that when you've got nasty conditions, it's just something you know how to do. Um, hi Bryn, um, what do you see as the main reason for pilots leaving the sport? Costs, external pressures, not enough free time, safety. Um, yeah. A big one is family. Um, I think a lot of pilots get into the sport uh, when they're free and single or when life is simple and then family comes along and it's a wonderful thing. I have my own family, but it's very hard to mix. It's like oil and water to try and paraglide and family life, particularly if you're working full time, you need time for your family and you also need a lot of time for flying. So it's a time pressure thing. Um, I'm in the very lucky position of working for myself. So I think a lot of the pilots that I see regularly are self-employed. Um, there are various trades that support paragliding, um, <laughs> garden services, um, guys that do short building contracts, um, guys that do IT contracts, any contractor kind of working. Um, which means that they can then say, oh, I've got a meeting on Monday because the weather's looking good without messing up things. So they're getting flying in the week, which means the family time on the weekend isn't impacted as much. They don't need to take the Saturday to go and fly because they've already had some flying on Monday. Um, but that is a, that's a big reason. I think I see pilots that have been flying for quite a while and then they have a family and then they just don't have enough time. It's a frustration. It's always difficult to line up the time. And then they, they stop flying. Um, so that's a, that's a big one. And a lot of pilots then find they come back into the sport again. Um, you know, 20 years later, 15 years later. And I see a lot of that with guys coming back, wanting to retrain, wanting to refresh. They were experienced, but they had a big break. Um, and that's, that's just a natural... That's a natural way of playing the game. Um, you, you fly when you're young and single and free, and then you fly again when your kids are old enough and uh, you've got the time back um, without you know, messing things up. Kids are at the mall or they're <laughs> racing your car around or something, <laughs> and you've now got the time to, to be able to do it. So yeah, it is mainly time. Um, it's, you, you need a lot of extra time to be able to go to the site when it's not flyable and ha not have the feeling that you've lost the only chance you had to fly um, because that puts pilots in a very desperate place. I see pilots that are very time limited flying in rubbish conditions because they're so desperate to fly. They'll fly in absolutely anything, but they're rusty. That's why they're so desperate to fly. So it's a toxic mix and you, you're looking for an accident that way. Um, and most, most pilots realize that and they back off. And they fly either a very safe glider on very safe sites in very safe conditions or they just take a break for a while and then come back into the sport. Um, whew, okay, I'm trying to catch up to the questions here. Um, <laughs> I see I'm a little bit behind the curve. I'll do my best to catch up, guys. Um, cool. Um, and if, if any of you guys are enjoying this sort of live streaming stuff and you want to support the channel, there is a donate button down the bottom. It's like a super chat. You can buy one of those. It just means your question comes up in a big green box. Um, and uh, that's great. It uh, adds to the beer fund and keeps, keeps the show on the road. Um, cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skim down to Kartik's question. How could you share some advice on active flying a paraglider? Okay, this should be a whole video. <laughs> um, active flying, the main one 
As I said in my video recently, the main one that you're wanting to try and um, get on top of is the pitch forward, is that movement. So this you can train yourself best by flying hands up so that you're at maximum speed and then just trying to time things. If you just fly hands up in thermic conditions, as you fly into a thermal, you won't get a collapse, you don't have to worry about it because as you enter the thermal, the airflow tends to be coming more from underneath. So there's a period there where your glide is adjusting to the new airflow where it's got a high angle of attack. So it's not likely to collapse in that transition. Um, where it's likely to collapse is when you come out the other side. So that's what you're trying to time. You're not worrying about turning left or right, let's say you're not trying to thermal up, you're just trying to work on your active flying. There's always some of these little bumps in the air that you go through. So as your glider goes into it, it will sit slightly behind you, keep it flying, keep your hands up and time it and wait. And now as the wing accelerates, you slow it down and then you come back to level flying. So it's just an input, it's like one, two and back. And that's a fairly deep movement because the glide is accelerating forward, you can actually break it quite a lot. You're not going to stall it just in active flying, like just pulling in the brakes for one or two seconds. And that's the one that I would play with. That's the most important one. It's that surge forward and catching the glider. And pretty much whenever my glider surges forward, I've got some brake on and I decide how much I want to rein that glider back. But I never let, just let the glider, you know, f whip forward like that. So play with that and just let the glider accelerate a little bit. Now obviously you want to do this with a bit of height. You know, you're not doing this like right over the slope because the danger is when you're getting this wrong, if you let the glider go forward and you have a collapse, that can turn you and you need height to recover from that. So yeah, do it when you've got loads of height and then you can just play, let your hands up and just play with that pitching. If you haven't got thermic conditions, you can play with pulling down on the brakes generating a little bit of a pitch, releasing, letting the glider surge forward on the second one, touch the brakes again, hold them as you're climbing, when the glider starts going, release it, and you can get a little dolphin movement. Don't make it too extreme. All you're trying to do is just get a pitch so that you can then learn on the timing as the glider comes back. On the last one, you put your hands up and you swing through, and you wait, and you watch the wing, and as it dies forward, you come down on the brakes. And that is, that's the most important part of active flying. So hopefully that, that gives you something to work on. Hey, thanks, Alex. Um, Alex has smashed that super chat. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, any downsides to learning XC on a high performance wing? Uh, granted, you SIV'd it a lot and can handle the wing nicely. Um, no, I mean, if you can handle the wing well, then you've got an advantage on a uh, high performance ENC, END. And that's kind of the reason why you want to do this pilot progression and work on your skills and do SIV courses so that you can tap into the ENC, END class for cross country flying. You've got that speed. And that's a big safety factor for me. Um, I, I don't really want to fly XC on an END um, because I feel like I'm leaving 10 kilometers an hour on the table. Um, and that's a big safety thing to have with you. You can accelerate the ENC and END particularly. Um, that's high speed on bar. So that's where you're trying to get to um, because no, now you've got speed in the mountains. So you've got a lot more ability to explore and make a mistake. Like, oh, it's a little bit stronger than I thought. I can push out on bar and I can get away from the mountains. So I don't, I don't see it as being a disadvantage being on an ENC, END. Um, what you've got to be careful of with the ENC, END is make sure that you regularly, at least once a year, do your um, line check and glider check. If you've got a service center, send it in. If you're confident doing it on your own, just make sure you're checking that glider because the trim does go out more on the ENC, END and they become more critical and then they start be behaving badly in SRV. Um, Thanks, Nicola. Appreciate it. You've got a blue super chat. <laughs> That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit and try and find some of your questions. Hi, Harold B. 
Um, hey, Peter Elliott, uh, best safety advice is to watch all of Greg's videos. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I, I, I get to watch these videos quite a lot, you realize. So I don't watch my videos once up on YouTube. Um, I probably watch uh, every video about 20, 20 to 25 times during editing. Um, so I really love watching other channels on YouTube. <laughs> um, hi, Slaz Marj. And hey, Jim, CR 120. Um, family is so essential. It can be so easy to get wrapped up in our own fun that we forget those who mean the most. Absolutely. So, um, I mean, once you've got a family, you understand it and it's just natural. You have to, um, and it's not a, it's not a burden. You, you want to spend time with your family, um, but it does impact the sport. So quite often when guys start a family, you'll see they just downgrade a bit. Um, get onto a simpler glider, maybe get a light hike and fly glider, um, because that's the sort of thing that you can put in the boot of your car and really compact kit. Um, and that just keeps you in touch with the sport. You can go and play ground handling when you need to. You can just walk up and fly down and you focus more on just getting in the air rather than the big chasing the distance. Um, and there's a whole lot of fun to be had with just playing around, being close to the slope, playing with ground handling, launching in super light conditions and walking up and flying down. Um, and that, that's more sort of family friendly. You know, you can be on holiday at a campsite, you can go up a slope, come back down again, carry on with you know, building sand castles and such like. Um, cool. Uh, Peter Elliott asks, an ENB gets you into the fun class, which can get you into a win a bit easier. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and the, the ENB wings, uh, yeah, they're pretty good these days. You know, the performance on trim speed, if you're just thermaling around, you, you can keep up with everybody. It's not a problem. It's only when you're going on big glide. Um, Nick Platt, I'll pick up a question from you. Um, oh, he, he's just answered something. Thanks, Nick. Um, he said, I think it's up to the manufacturer. Weight ranges vary as well. Um, each was a different size. So we're talking about weight ranges. Uh, surface area for my size wing is up to two square meters different from different manufacturers. How can that be? That's the next question. Um, yeah, okay. The, the sizing on gliders, um, there isn't an exact science for this. Manufacturers decide what they like. It depends what their aims are for that particular model in that particular time in the market. Um, if you've got a glider maybe you designed that had a reputation for um, sinking out and pilots were saying, oh no, I won't fly that because it's, no, it hasn't got the performance. Well, you'll see the next one they make will be a little bit bigger um, per, per you know, pilot weight range. Um, so the bigger wing gives you a little bit more lift, which means you've got a little bit more climb, which means then the pilots are thinking, oh, oh this new one's actually climbing well, but now it's lost out on the speed a little. So there, you know, it depends what the manufacturer is trying to do. And I would say that it's important to listen to what the manufacturer is recommending because they're the ones that have made the wing. They've taken their test pilots and they've flown them and they've gone, hmm, this is really nice. It's 75 kilos. So we'll make this weight range like 70 to 80 or 65 to 80. So the pilots are in a nice place. Um, they could quite easily make the weight range to 90. It would probably still pass the EN test, but they'll find that pilots are then flying the wing and getting a higher sink rate and not being quite as competitive with other pilots on the ridge. So they make another glider that overlaps it and then you get the next one in the next step in the class. Some manufacturers decide that they want to split the market up into five or six gliders instead of making four gliders to span everything. Um, because they feel, based on their marketing, they can sell more gliders in the different sizes and they can afford to test the different size. Um, every size of wing needs its own testing and it has its own development tweaks that need to be done to it. So it's expensive to make six gliders across a range rather than five. So one manufacturer will have five wings, the other will have six so there you'll already see a difference in the weight 
the size of the wing just because the manufacturer has changed the way they've split up the market. I wouldn't get too um, stuck on weight ranges. And I don't believe that there's like an, a perfect weight for every glider. Uh, all you do by changing your weight on the glider is changing the optimal time of day for that wing and your weight combination. Um, you put on more weight on the wing, you get a higher sink rate, you get more speed. So you get better glide performance into wind and you get a little bit more safety that it's more rigid. But then you don't have the climb rate. So early in the day, if you were light on, on a wing, you'd have an advantage. If you took some ballast, you'd lose that advantage, but you'd gain it later in the day. And the wings are quite tolerant, particularly in the B class. You know, you could have weight over the wing or under the wing, and it would still be safe. But yes, you want to be ideally somewhere in the middle of the weight range. Normally, 50 to 75 percent of the weight range is a good place. Um, but it varies on the wing, so I'm not going to give a blanket general um, advice there because each wing and each designer has a slightly different take on it and they're also the, the square meterage figure that they use could be calculated slightly differently. It depends the, the surface area of the glider, the flat surface, you lay a paraglider down on the ground and you tell me if it's lying absolutely flat, it's very difficult. Do you stretch it a little bit? Has it got moisture in it? When it like contracts a little bit? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a curved surface with curved surfaces in it that's stitched. It's difficult to have an, a precise, and sure, it should come out of the computer package, but the computer package has to then decide how much puckering does the fabric give you with your weight on it. It's not exact. So take it with a pinch of salt and fly somewhere mid to top weight range. That's to me is a, the best advice I can give you and then just go and fly your wing, not worry about it too much. Um, it's more important how you thermal. Thanks Nick, Nick Wilder, appreciate it. Um, hey John, I got you into the sport. I'm responsible. <laughs> okay, great, uh, fantastic. Uh, it, I think it's a, it's a brilliant thing. I think we are, we are so lucky. This has never happened in the history of humankind. We've got our own aircraft. We can go and fly anytime. Well, weather dependent. Um, but it's, it's a brilliant thing to do. And uh, I love sharing what I know. Um, everybody has a different path in the sport. We can learn something from everybody. There's something different that you've experienced than from what I've experienced. So I'm just trying to share as much as I can. Um, because this is a whole new thing for human evolution to be flying. So we need to share skills. We need to, you know, network and uh, build up as fast as we can because we're still babies in the sky. I mean, I've only had a you know, few thousand hours of flying and uh, that doesn't uh, come close to what an eagle has in its lifetime. So um, keep flying, keep sharing. Um, cool. Thanks, Harold B. So we're getting on to um, 4 a.m. here, <laughs> 8 in the evening. Um, we're getting close to the end of the live stream. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up a few more questions because um, I haven't kept up with the, the number of questions here. Um, but I do appreciate you guys staying with me. It's lovely having a big chat. And uh, when I'm finished, you can go watch some videos on Fly with Greg. Cool. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm just trying to trying to pick up a question quickly, and uh, see here. Renard asks, are high ENB gliders actually ENC? <laughs> okay. For which aspect ratio is piloting changing a lot? Um, okay, it does change depending on the aspect ratio. I think you've picked up on a point there that's important. Um, the aspect ratio does affect the difficulty to pilot a glider. It's, there's definitely a, a direct link there. As you stretch the wing more, they become a little bit more difficult, particularly with the tips going when you thermaling the outer tip and that leading to maybe having cravats and complications and also just dealing with the wing when it stalls or it spins, you're getting more of a bendy wing because let's face it, it's made out of floppy fabric and there's only so much they can do with stiffening. 
Um, so I think the higher aspect, you need to make sure that you've got your airspeed all the time, that you're flying it with nice, not too much brake, because that's where you run into problems with them. Are the ENB gliders ENC? I don't think so. Um, I think there was, there was a, a, a patch um, maybe 10 years ago where manufacturers were pushed right up to trying to outdo each other and go right to the limit of the class to get the most performance so that they would then be the winner in the class. Um, I think at the moment, looking at the classes, I think they, they're nicely placed. I think a, a ENB, the ENB has definitely split into two. There's definitely an ENB and a high B. Um, so there's, there's almost two classes there. It's almost like we need another definition. Um, but from a high B to a C, yes, there is still a difference. And I think, you know, you could take some of the E and C wings and retrim them and get them through a B. Um, I think that's possible. And I think the manufacturers now are realizing this wing is more suited for the E and C. This is what we're aiming it for. And we won't try and get it into an E and B. You'd think, okay, well, wow, you can sell a lot more gliders. But I think that it works against you as a manufacturer because then you're getting pilots that aren't ready for the C class that are flying this retrimmed C. Um, and it leads to pilots being overwhelmed. So I think looking at the wings that are available now, no, I think they're in the right category. But I think pilots got to be aware that uh, there's a B, a low B, a mid B, and a high B. And you'll see most manufacturers have got two wings in their B space, at least, maybe three. So the higher one, bear in mind, that is trimmed to be close to the top of the class. I don't think they are right at the limit. I think most of the manufacturers have come back a bit from the, the edge, the cliff edge of the ENB testing. Um, but it is more demanding than the lower B. And... It's particularly in the amount of energy that it's got. Um, I think it moves around more. It's got more active flying input required. Whereas the low B can pretty much just cruise around by itself and you don't have to be on it. The high B you do need to be piloting actively. And that's for a regular pilot that's got regular airtime. If you an occasional pilot, you want to be on the lower B. So hope that helps answer your question there. Um, thanks, Shadi. Um, appreciate your super chat. Very cool. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Nick. Awesome, man. Really cool. Thanks, Jeff Falcon and Harold B. And Nick Wilder. Appreciate it. Very cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Um, and Nicola and Alex. Uh, appreciate all the super chats. That's very cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's fa fantastic. I mean, uh, if you guys do want to support the channel, come over to flywithgreg.com, have a look and see what the training is all about. Um, you could just join for a month if you wanted to, see what it's like. There's a free trial as well. So check that out. Um, Jim CR 120, uh, five days more training. Flying with the sun has been fantastic. That's great. My little daughter's uh, seven, so it's going to be a while before we do flight training with her. Um, but she's already taken control of the tandem glider, so <laughs> we'll see another another little Hamilton pilot coming out in a few years' time. Um, Louise. Um, okay, so Louis asks, I'm a paraglider pilot at 14 years old. Any tips? Well... You're starting at the right time. Fantastic. Um, what, most of the young pilots that I come across, they do lots of ground handling because they're limited in opportunities to free fly themselves. Depends on where you are and if you're restricted on um, your access to the air. Um, I think it's, it, it's probably a good thing. Um, it gives you a really good foundation. And so play around with ground handling and sort of ground handling. Give yourself ground handling challenges like flying your wing over things and onto things and off hay bales and, um, you know, trying to, like, kite the wing up a slope, messing around with that. 
you build a strong foundation with kiting, with ground handling. You can learn so much about stall point, spin point, everything on the ground. Um, play around with low flying. Just find a field and a low sloping field and play around with that. The, the skills you build there will last you your lifetime with flying. Um, so usually I find with pilots that have started young, they've just got this amazing wing control. And that will just take you through everything in the sky. Then you want to try and find places where you can fly, where you can get lots of airtime cheaply. Um, and the best place I think for that is like sand dunes and slopes where you can fly low flights and you can walk the glider back up again and just lob off. And that's just so much fun. So just have a lot of fun low level flying, um, building up experience there. Because that'll probably um, mean your dad's not um, too worried <laughs> about where you're flying. Um, I think the thing to be careful of when you're young and you're flying um, is the, the desire to just go off on your own and go and have an adventure. Um, it's a strong pull and it's an emotional feeling and it's very difficult to resist it. You want to try and be as mature as you can with that because flying yourself away from other pilots and people that can help you means that if you have a crash, and you are somewhere and nobody knows where you are, it can be a serious situation. And when you're young, you don't really um, feel that sense of uh, fear for what could go wrong. Um, often you're just like, hey, well, we'll just try this, we'll do that, we'll race down the hill in a soapbox cart um, until you crash and then you realize, ooh, um, that wasn't such a good idea. So keep yourself with other pilots if you can in a, in a controlled environment. I know it's frustrating, um, but become a master of that environment so that all of your skills are there. When you start going cross country and you start flying away, you've got the skills that mean you're likely to stay um, in the sweet spot with your glider um, because I think that's, that's the risk when you're flying young is that you don't appreciate... Um, how risky things can be when you're out on your own um, because it's a great feeling being out on your own. Um, I can't really uh, criticize that because that's really what I did when I started. I, I just took a glider and man, I was off for the mountains. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what's going to happen. But try and build up as much um, skills as you can uh, at, in a f safe environment before you go. Um, high, wild and free. Get to see you from Nepal. I don't know what time that makes it in Nepal. Um, oh, I suppose it's like in the morning sometime. So, cool. Okay, guys, I'm going to wrap up the chat. Um, I'm going to get on to doing some editing work. It's been wonderful having all of you guys here in the chat. Um, I really appreciate it. It's nice to have contact with everybody around the world. And it's great that there's always some flying happening. So, wherever you are, I hope you've got a nice flying day. Um, if you have, take, take a picture and put it on Facebook. It might pop up in my feed. Um, make a little video, put it on YouTube. I'll probably see that too. And uh, keep in touch. And I appreciate your support. Thank you very much. I'll see you in the next live stream, whenever that is. I can't do these too often, but um, I will pop up again for this time slot. And if you subscribe to YouTube, You'll see the notification coming up and it'll let you know, hey, Greg's live. Uh, well, sort of live, <laughs> depending on the time of day. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. It's been awesome. You have a good evening if you're in the States and uh, a good morning if you're on the east of Europe. Um, thanks. Thanks, Peter, from New Zealand. You are sometime in the day. Go fly. <laughs> See ya. Thanks a lot, guys. Keep well. And I've got to turn you off another phone. Cheers. <laughs>